I'm John Slattery. I'm the Vice Dean for uh, Research and Graduate Education. And it's an uh, absolute pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Kemi Dole here uh, today um, as um, a young investigator, uh, science and in, in, uh, medicine talk, to deliver a young investigator science and medicine talk. Uh, uh, Kemi uh, did uh, a BS in engineering, actually in biomedical engineering at Duke. Uh, went on to do an MD at Columbia, and then a uh, master's in science in clinical research and, uh, and epidemiology at uh, the University of North uh, Carolina. So she does move around a bit. Uh, she went on to do a residency at uh, Northwestern Memorial Hospital, a fellowship, uh, University of North Carolina, and then also a postdoctoral research fellowship in cancer care quality in the Department of Health Policy and Management at UNC. Um, she uh, then stayed at UNC briefly as a clinical instructor uh, before coming to uh, the last place she's going to move to. <laughs> and that's uh, 2016 here, uh, began as assistant professor uh, in uh, the department of uh, OBGYN in the division of gyne uh, gynecologic oncology. She's also uh, a member uh, research faculty in the Surgical Outcomes uh, Research Center here in the School of Medicine and um, an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Health Services in the School of Public Health. More recently though, um, she's crossed to the dark side of uh, administration, I guess, for a part <laughs> of her time. Uh, and she uh, has been named director for URM faculty development. Uh, and I believe prior to that um, and continuing is, is a member of the UW Medicine Healthcare Equity uh, Steering Committee. Uh, she's also, um, just in case you're concerned that that wasn't enough, uh, she's also co-founder of Encana, uh, the Endometrial uh, Cancer uh, Action Network for uh, African-Americans. Uh, she does have time for research. Uh, she's going to be talking to us about uh, her research today. And uh, Kemi is focused on examining black, white racial inequality in the care of benign and malignant uh, gynecologic disease in the US. And today she's going to present her work in using uh, critical race approaches uh, to study uh, inequity in, in endometrial cancer in the US. Uh, Kemi, I hope that described you a bit. Uh, thank you very much and take it away. John, thank you so much. Um, and I wanna thank all of the faculty members, my peers who nominated me um, to give this lecture. It's quite an honor and I'm excited to speak to you all today about my work uh, using critical race approaches to investigate the black white mortality gap in endometrial cancer. My goals today are to introduce health equity frameworks and theories, specifically the ones that I use, to demonstrate their application in endometrial cancer disparities, and ultimately to hopefully prompt you to consider your own areas of work. I'm gonna start with discussing the problem, the black-white mortality gap in endometrial cancer. Endometrial cancer is a, line, is a cancer of the lining of the uterus or womb. In the United States, it's the most common gynecologic cancer at about 63,000 cases per year, new cases, um, with, whose incidence is actually increasing, um, which is fairly rare among cancers in the United States at this point. That results in a lifetime risk of about one in 37 uh, for women by age 80. And overall, endometrial cancer has a good reputation with a fairly high five-year survival of over 80%. With regard to burden of disease, in the United States, among white and black women, endometrial cancer burden is fairly similar. So endometrial cancer incidence is increasing, which is not the focus of my talk, but in the United States, the incidence of endometrial cancer by race is fairly similar, um, specifically with regard to white and black women. The mortality, however, is not. In the United States, black women have an over 90% higher five-year mortality after an endometrial cancer di diagnosis compared to white women and all other groups of women. With regard to cancer disparities, because it can be hard to put this into context, 
This is actually one of the largest black white mortality gaps in all of cancer care in the United States. It is larger than the disparity we see in cervical cancer, breast cancer, and colorectal cancer, second only to stomach and multiple myeloma, which are much less common. That is the problem. So let's talk about some theoretical grounding and preliminary work. Before we get into theory, I think we need to make explicit what is often the unspoken curriculum on racial disparities research, certainly was my experience as a clinician researcher and a black scientist in academic medicine, endorsed by some of our most high impact publications. This idea that disparities work is somehow about social justice issues and not real science. That disparities research is low hanging fruit an easy abstract or sub analysis for a trainee, yet somehow simultaneously, racial disparities are also too complex to fix. I offer to you that these kinds of, in many ways, paradoxical ideas, but very powerful prevalent ideas in academic medicine result from a general lack of knowledge about theoretical frameworks and conceptual grounding in health inequity. So my disclosure for my talk today is that I have a perspective, not just as a black woman in the United States, but as somebody who's taken time to read about the intersection of race and gender and health and how that results in the health outcomes that we have today. In addition to scholarship that comes from outside of our field, from sociology and anthropology, we also have incredibly powerful and useful frameworks come, that come from within public health and medicine to help us make sense of how we can study race, gender, and health in a meaningful way and move towards equity. I'm going to review three such frameworks today. It was in the setting of doing this reading, it was in the setting of expanding my viewpoint beyond clinical training that I started to think about endometrial cancer disparities, not as an issue of cancer disparity, but as an issue of black women's reproductive health. In the United States, black women have higher rates of fibroids during their reproductive years, higher rates of irregular cycles, less success with infertility and higher rates of premenopausal hysterectomy up to three to four times higher than other women. On to the act of reproduction, black women suffer from higher rates of preterm birth, preterm labor, low birth weight infants and maternal morbidity and mortality. And on to the postmenopausal peri and postmenopausal period, black women also have higher mortalities in ovarian, cervical and endometrial cancer, the focus of this talk. And so when considering this reproductive life course perspective, we can ask ourselves, what is wrong with black women in the US? Or we can ask ourselves, what is wrong with the environment and the experiences that black women are subject to? To take the latter approach, it's helpful to have guiding frameworks. There is no way in the world that one slide or even one entire talk can give justice to each of these frameworks. However, I will briefly review them in order to inform the rest of the talk. The first is the public health critical race praxis, which is an adaptation of critical race theory that originated in legal studies. It has multiple principles as well as different phases of research. And I will focus today on the fact that it makes very clear and emphasizes that racism is omnipresent in society and it's active in the daily lives of people of color. There are not racist versus non-racist environments. Racial biases inform therefore the nature of research questions and our, as investigators, a priori assumptions that drive research. And therefore research in these areas should be explicitly equity oriented. This led me to ask the question about how has knowledge about black women with endometrial cancer been constructed given these racial biases. Fundamental cause theory explains the enduring link between socioeconomic status and mortality that persists over time due to differential access to key flexible resources. Regardless of medical innovation, what we know throughout history and now is that there is an enduring link between those at the lowest socioeconomic status 
and overall mortality. And this is due to the differential, differential access to knowledge, money, power, prestige, and social connections, which means that differences in health outcomes that are based on social position in a society like race arise in the context of the treatability of a given condition. When we can do something about it is where we are going to see the most marked inequities by race. That led me to ask, what are the modifiable factors that contribute to the black-white mortality gap in endometrial cancer? Finally, the eco-social theory of disease distribution is focused around the concept of embodiment or how we as humans literally biologically embody exposures arising from our societal and ecological context, thereby producing population rates and distributions of disease. And when, we'll end here with questions that led me to ask about how the social environment influences biologic differences in EC histology and treatment outcomes. So first, how has knowledge about black women with endometrial cancer been constructed? I started where we all start with our research, which is reviewing the literature and see what, seeing what's been done before. However, we did this literature review with, this, with the deliberateness of the race conscious lens, asking how race has been conceptualized and how it is being interpreted. What we found was that race was defined almost exclusively as a biological or genetic entity and that there was an enduring assumption that healthcare environments represent colorblind spaces. So when comparing black and white women's outcomes in endometrial cancer, for example, in the VA system, or for example, on a clinical trial, if there were differences by race, they could only be biological or genetic and not be subject to differential experiences of the same environment. We also found repeated observational studies documenting surgical disparities specifically, almost on cue every 10 years without any intervening work to address the inequity. And so we're not talking about solving the entire problem, but even the first steps, pilot studies to understand why black women were not getting treated at the same rate as their peers. And finally, there was an absence of the black woman's voice. And I would offer to you that these are consequences of the assumption. If race is purely biologic or genetic, then we don't intervene on known treatment inequities that we see. If healthcare environments represent colorblind spaces, then there's no impetus to ask women how their experiences might be different than their peers. So how had knowledge about Black women with endometrial cancer been constructed when I started my work in 2016? We had nearly 30 years of atheoretical research. We had no qualitative work, we had no intervention work, and we had no public health awareness. This is why research on racial disparity in health should be theoretically grounded and informed by race scholarship. Fundamental cause theory, differences in outcomes based on social position in a society arise in the context of the treatability of a given condition, is not just a lofty idea, but is borne out even within my field of gynecologic oncology. These are black-white mortality rate ratios for gynecologic cancer. And what you'll notice immediately is that ovarian cancer, which is a disease we've made incredible progress with in therapeutics, in terms of five-year survival, but the 10-year survival has not budged. Most women who get into ovarian cancer will die of ovarian cancer. And we see the most narrow disparities by race in this, in this cancer that does not have a lot of treatability or amenability in terms of survival. Contrast that with cervical cancer, which is not just treatable, but wholly preventable nearly at this point. And we see a much larger disparity. Uterine or endometrial cancer is in the middle. And how it differs is that we have not had the kind of national resource independent targeted interventions that we've had for cervical cancer to decrease the racial inequity. So what are these modifiable factors that we can target? In preliminary work, we did a cohort simulation using national cancer registry data the SEER 18 registry specifically. We looked at five years of endometrial cancer cases or over 30,000 cases total. And what we found in the simulation model was holding all other things constant and simply asking the question, 
if black women were able to have surgery at the same rates as their white counterparts, if black women were able to be diagnosed at the same stage as their white counterparts, holding all other things equal, like the aggressiveness of histology or the age of diagnosis, what would be the impact on the mortality gap? And what we found was that 40% of the black white mortality gap is attributable to stage of diagnosis and surgery rates. And the vast majority of that was at stage of diagnosis. This led to my hypothesis that formed the basis of my career development award, which is that stage of diagnosis is a major and modifiable contributor to racial disparities and endometrial cancer. Racial differences in stage of diagnosis actually vary by healthcare setting. So unless our hypothesis is that these women are genetically distinct from each other, we have to then open the possibility that the environment and the quality of care are actually differing. Guidelines for the diagnostic workup and management of endometrial cancer symptoms allow for many pathways to diagnosis, whether it's ultrasound, a tissue biopsy, or dilation and curatage. These require different levels of expertise, have differential aspects, and overall are um, not very specified in our guidelines, which allows for varying quality of care. Finally, and I would say nearly most importantly, adherence to guidelines might be influenced by the normalization of bleeding in Black women. And this is where the context of Black women's reproductive health is so critical. In our society, where Black women have higher rates of fibroids in irregular cycles that cause abnormal bleeding in younger Black women, this may be resulting in a normalcy of abnormal bleeding in older Black women that is also a sign of endometrial cancer. A normalcy not just held by the women themselves, but as, as providers as well, who care for these younger women with multiple episodes of fibroids and bleeding. In fact, we might have a racialized view of the primary symptom of endometrial cancer. So moving forward with this hypothesis on stage of diagnosis, we adapted the Anderson model of total patient delay in order to have a framework to organize the different intervals of care, not just care, not just the interval during the time of being um, seen by a physician or by a healthcare provider, but going all the way back until the, from the time that a patient detects initial symptom of bleeding all the way through to histologic diagnosis. And this framework is important because each of these intervals represent um, they represent distinct intervals that have differing um, influences in terms of what contributes to delay. And without clear definitions, it's very easy for us to miss specific important modifiable factors. And so I'll now talk about care delay in endometrial cancer and current work. The first study we did was looking at the diagnostic interval. So the time from for first consultation with a provider to histologic diagnosis, known to be influenced by the things in the box above. In this first study, we use SEER Medicare data, which is national cancer registry data linked with Medicare claims across the country. This means that everyone included in the study was insured continuously by Medicare or Medicare plus Medicaid, or Medicare, Medicaid, or, or Medicare plus private insurance. So these are insured individuals. We looked at 10 years of endometrial cancer cases and used the claims to identify symptoms and procedure pro procedures prior to diagnosis. And what we found was that Black women had a higher risk for non-guideline adherent workup of their symptoms of endometrial cancer. 30 to 90% higher. And these non-guideline pathways were associated with more advanced stage disease. Again, these are all insured women seeking care in the healthcare system. And you can see there an absolute difference of about 10%. We concluded from the study that although black women are at greatest, are at greatest risk for aggressive histologic subtypes, so it is known that black women are more likely to have more aggressive types of endometrial cancer, which I'll be speaking about later, they were less likely, despite having insurance, to have their bleeding characterized as postmenopausal. In other words, a woman at 72 coming in with bleeding was being coded as having a heavy period as opposed to postmenopausal bleeding, which would prompt appropriate 
um, next steps. To have their bleeding documented at all or to have appropriate diagnostic procedures. And these non-guideline concordant pathways were significantly associated with advanced stage of diagnosis and represent a potential point of intervention. And the story was a little bit more complicated because when we looked at time intervals, we were able to look at influencing factors on the time interval itself. And what we found was that black women, again, within this diagnostic time interval, had a 27% longer diagnostic time interval. However, it was explained why by the difference in bleeding classification, the recognition of bleeding being abnormal, and the lack of a prompt biopsy, ultrasound, or DNC lasting past seven days. We also found, however, overall, the interval was narrow at about 28 days. And so time independently was not associated with stage of diagnosis, which is why the framework of the Anderson model that allows us to see the multiple layers of time accumulated is so important. So on to the appraisal interval. This is from the time that a woman detects bleeding till the time that she perceives a reason to seek care. So this is before they ever enter a healthcare system. We wanted to ask the question, how are black women experiencing symptoms and healthcare interactions prior to and during a diagnosis of endometrial cancer? This was a community engaged qualitative study of 32 black and white women um, 15 black women and 17 white women, where we did semi-structured interviews, one to two hours long, very much in depth on their specific experience of menopause, symptom onset, and diagnosis. And what we found, again, briefly, is that black women expressed multiple factors associated with delay in the appraisal interval. They reported that the nature of their symptoms did not seem new bothersome or painful, all aspects that would normally prompt quick um, healthcare, um, uh, prompt the decision to seek care quickly. They also reported misattribution of symptoms to fibroids in irregular cycles, making sense with the larger context of reproductive healthcare. And their cue to action, their cue to seek care was not simply the onset of postmenopausal bleeding. It was a personal waiting period. Sometimes that was two weeks, sometimes that was a year and also waiting for increased symptom severity. So the onset of cramps or bloating, which we know as clinicians are signs of cancer progression. There were so many powerful quotes from this study, but I will just highlight one for the sake of time in this talk. This woman said, I was just surprised, just surprised in talking about when she started bleeding at the age of 68 not alarmed because it wasn't heavy at all, very light, but it was there. And I'm like, is that blood? Because it was nothing compared to what I'd been used to since I was in my twenties, nothing. And so this woman started bleeding in February and she did not report her bleeding until her routine appointment with her primary care provider in October. What we found going through all of the quotes and the themes were that there were specific areas of vulnerability in this appraisal period. Vulnerability around knowledge about menopause and the menopausal transition with silencing around the specific symptoms of bleeding among black women not talked about as well as an absence of knowledge because of the high rate of hysterectomy in black families. So there were not a lot of examples of women who had gone through menopause naturally. There was also vulnerability around prior negative reproductive health care experiences, specifically around seeking gynecologic health care and feelings of microaggression and explicit discrimination. And then as well as confusion around having co-occurring gynecologic conditions like fibroids or a history of heavy periods. Now, what's important about this focus is that these areas of vulnerability were not unique to Black women, they were just more pronounced in Black women. So when we compare to the interviews we did with white women, we saw that there were areas of similar vulnerability like endometrial cancer knowledge, which makes sense because at the time we had no national dialogue around endometrial cancer. White women also express different negative reproductive health care experiences were more likely to talk about that excuse me, obesity and fat shaming as reasons to avoid care. But what you can see here is the differential vulnerability. When we add on to that, the other underlying risk, 
structurally access to quality healthcare provider relationship. Epidemiologically, the difference in the underlying histologic risk by race, you start to see how the vulnerabilities add up. And this is the kind of framework that we can use to, to also identify and consider other marginalized populations who might similarly experience vulnerabilities. Native indigenous women, trans, queer, and gender non-binary individuals, immigrants, refugees, and or low English proficiency patients, and more. Ultimately, what's interesting about this study is I'm not sure that I had to do it. This study is from 1996. Differences between black and white patients with cancer of the uterine corpus, an interval from symptom recognition to initial medical consultation. They did a time to event analysis using rate of initial consultation over person days following symptom recognition. And what they found was that overall, white women got to a medical provider appointment faster. And so the measure is a little bit difficult to interpret, but the higher the number, the quicker. And Black women were about half as quick at 0.6 visits per person days. This was the finding of the study. Then they adjusted. Adjusted for geography. Adjusted for occupation adjusted for access to a primary care provider, adjusted for the known racially patterned social factors that influence care. And so the conclusion of this study was that there was no difference in care delay by race. In the discussion, the authors point out that bleeding was the primary symptom of endometrial cancer. This is what they're saying with this quote. And so there was little racial difference in the fact that both black and white women experience bleeding as their primary symptom. And thus, it is unclear how there may be cultural differences in recognition of this symptom. Our racial positioning, our awareness, or our lack thereof influences the design and interpretation of our studies. And this is why engaging with the marginalized community of interest is not the nice thing to do. It's not the addition, it's not a bonus, it's required in any true effort aimed at healthcare equity, because otherwise we will miss what we need to see in order to intervene on behalf of equity. The final project for my Career Development Award was again a focus on the diagnostic care interval, but a focus instead on the providers. I had planned to do this from the beginning of this, um, of this research arc. However, I was even more um, encouraged to do this work because from the interviews of the women, what they told me was even when they got to the point of disclosing symptoms, what they were met with was very concerning. This quote, I think really exemplifies it. At the doctor's office, just going for a regular pap smear, you know, and saying, you know, I've been doing some spotting. This woman is 63. And her, the reply that she got was, oh, that's just normal, that happens. And basically that was it. So given that a lot of women, especially who are postmenopausal, no longer are seeing women's healthcare providers as their primary point of entry to the medical system, we want to know how are perimenopausal reproductive symptoms assessed by first line, in this case, providers. So this is a national survey of over 1,500 mailed out case vignettes and a knowledge test. We specifically wanted to look across specialty beyond OBGYN to other, um, other um, providers who would be interacting with women primarily, as well as looking at different levels of training between MDs, nurse practitioners, and um, nurses. We completed a 10% pilot mailing in December. This was a national mailing to adjust um, our sampling to make sure that we got the appropriate numbers from each of these categories. And then COVID hit. <laughs> So this was delayed by COVID-19. And so our full mailing didn't happen until December of 2020. And, our and we are in data analysis now to add this to the framework of the potential multi-level intervention. However, while that was ongoing, I want to emphasize what listening, the power of qualitative work has wrought. Because the other thing that I heard from these women is that they said, I did have an ultrasound. I did get to the point where I had a diagnostic test, but they told me everything was okay. It was just my fibroids. Which begged the question, we were so focused on whether women are getting guideline, a concordant care or not, 
that we forgot to ask the question, how do our current clinical guidelines for transvaginal ultrasound screening specifically actually perform among US Black women at risk for endometrial cancer? The setting of this is that 90% of women with endometrial cancer present with postmenopausal bleeding, the vast majority, but only 10% of women with postmenopausal bleeding have endometrial cancer. So the paradigm, the clinical paradigm right now is to use transvaginal ultrasound, is, is recommended to screen symptomatic women and avoid unnecessary endometrial biopsy for most women. If endometrial thickness, which is the measurement that is taken from the ultrasound is less than four millimeters, then biopsy can be omitted with a 95% sensitivity and a 99 to 100% negative predictive value. These guidelines are based on four population-based studies. These studies are from Italy, Scandinavia, and Hong Kong. These studies do not include Black women. These studies exclude women with fibroids because fibroids distort the measurement of the endometrial thickness. Black women have an 80% fibroid prevalence in the United States. In addition, Black women uniquely have 30%, 30% of Black women diagnosed with endometrial cancer will have non-endometrioid histology compared to 10% or lower among other groups. This kind of histology tends not to cause the global thickness of the endometrium that we pick up on the screening test. So we wanted to do a population simulation to simply ask how well does this screening algorithm work for Black women in the US? Our data sources was again, CIR 18 Cancer Registry, the US Census to get estimates of black and white women population by age cohorts, using the largest population studies that we have that include black women and reproductive and gynecologic symptoms, the Black Women's Health Study and the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences Uterine Fibroid Study to get estimates on fibroid prevalence, and then published literature that looked at the distribution of histologic subtype by race, the distribution of fibroid history, current presence of fibroids, and distribution of endometrial thickness visibility by the presence of fibroids. The analysis of this simulation was essentially looking at diagnostic test performance, most specifically the sensitivity, the negative predictive value, and I'll call your attention to the area under the curve where 0.7 is considered the threshold for a test with meaningful discrimination. When we ran this analysis using the four millimeter cutoff among black women with postmenopausal bleeding in the United States, the sensitivity of the model was 47.5%. The negative predictive value was higher at 92% with an AUC of 0.57 that did not meet the threshold for a meaningful test. We ran a number of sensitivity analyses given these striking results. We excluded the one study of Jamaican women that we could find that included black women because it was a smaller study with less uh, accurate estimates. We increased the visibility of the endometrial thickness in the presence of fibroids beyond what we saw in the literature, guessing that maybe that was an underreport and increased it to 70 and then 80%. And still we could not reach an AUC in which this test was an appropriate strategy for Black women presenting with bleeding. We've subsequently done a comparison by race because again, this is a simulated model and we're comparing it against population-based studies, even though they're outside of the United States. So when we ran the same model with white women's characteristics from the United States, we did find that the sensitivity was lower than what's reported from those population-based studies at 87.9%. The negative predictive value, however, is still high and the AUC still reaches the threshold for a meaningful test. So overall, we have a 30% better performance of the guidelines themselves for white women compared to black women. These are the rock curves to see this visually. Guidelines that emphasize transvaginal ultrasound, they're based on a paradigm of a low risk population high accuracy of the test, and low consequences in the setting of a false negative. Because this screening strategy is not screening people out of getting major surgery like a hysterectomy. It's screening people out of getting a simple outpatient procedure 
like an endometrial biopsy. Unfortunately, these um, par parameters, low risk population, high accuracy, and low consequence, none of these assumptions apply to US black women at risk for endometrial cancer. They are a high risk population. There's low accuracy of the test and there's high consequences in the setting of a false negative from what we know already of a priori delay in seeking care, understandably, as well as in the underlying higher histologic risk of endometrial cancers that these women are diagnosed with. So our clinical algorithm currently has built in racial inequity and effectiveness, which also likely contributes to delayed diagnoses. When I first was conceptualizing this, I was thinking of delay as a linear path, as there are areas where maybe women would spend more time or less time, but essentially they're marching towards diagnosis. And I've now really adjusted or upgraded that to think of it more, to think of it differently. When we think about overlapping vulnerability and risk of care delay, I offer that a circle is more appropriate. Where we start bleeding, we start at the point of bleeding, and we assume what happens is that women go through these white arrows and pass from appraising their symptom as abnormal, seeking care, disclosing to a healthcare provider and initiating their diagnostic evaluation that ends in a diagnosis, ideally. But what we know is that there are several points along the way where women, especially black women, can easily fall off of this pathway. Not only do they fall off of the pathway, but I wanna emphasize that it's not necessarily that they re-enter where they left. In fact, what we heard from women was that they might get all the way to the point of disclosing to a healthcare provider and then have incorrect normalization of symptoms. And it would take a long time before the bleeding would cross the threshold to disclose again. You could have a woman that got all the way to initiating a diagnostic evaluation. We have an algorithm that is more likely to miss cancers in black women and then gets all the way back to the beginning of the circle again to start the cycle again. What threshold should then that woman have for re-reporting symptoms? I'm not sure that we have the techniques yet to actually measure what delay looks like when we think about this broader um, perspective. This is also why there's not one magical solution. There are many needed solutions in thinking about endometrial cancer, care delay, and stage of diagnosis. Now, my plan is to have an evidence-based multi-level intervention. And I've given you a lot of the building blocks. At the system and society level, increasing guideline adherent workup for Black women, but also now proposing changes to the current guidelines regarding this threshold for biopsy. At the provider level, when we finish analyzing the data, we will have understandings about the knowledge gaps and practice patterns that can be targeted with education, ongoing provider education. And then finally, at the patient and community level, we can have community education content to correct myths and remove silencing and shame around symptoms. Now, when I wrote this in 2016, my plan was to convene a stakeholder group of researchers, clinicians, and patients. And after getting funding, I realized that there was no visible group of Black women with endometrial cancer survivors who were ready to engage in research. This group didn't exist. Endometrial cancer did not have national prominence. And that is what led to the creation of Econa. Community engagement is so much more than simply meeting people around the table. It's a science. It's a deliberate process. And so what we found when, we, when I initially started to reach out to Black women to engage them in endometrial cancer research was a wealth of information that I hope anybody can relate to. And what I want to emphasize from this work is that our overlapping identities of race and gender were helpful, but they were not sufficient. That we had to, as a university team, use proactive mitigation strategies to account for a history of institutional discrimination. Um, and so I refer you back to this paper for anybody who's interested in community engagement, because we really tried to detail the process of how we went through this and how it was ultimately successful in both grant planning, proposal development, and funding. This led to the creation of ICANA, the Endometrial Cancer Action Network for African Americans, where the, our focus is community, education, and research. And we're a multi-stakeholder group of both Black women with endometrial cancer, researchers, as well as leaders from our field, as well as um, community leaders and organizers. 
We have a website, it has a lot of information. The goal being to have a visible community to remove the silencing around endometrial cancer, especially among Black women in the United States. We also had a conference in 2019 where we gathered women from all over again to initial, initiate the creation of community and to focus what the efforts were going forward to be on community building education and research training. Now, I'll be honest, at this meeting, everyone was convened. I was very excited. I told them about some of the data that, had, that we had generated thus far and our plan to be able to partner with ECANA in order to develop an intervention, evaluate and disseminate it sometime in 2023. And the women told me very specifically that they are not interested in waiting that long, that there were things that we could do right now, and they were correct. So at the conference, um, we had planned, based on the feedback we got during planning of the conference, to go ahead and deliver a peer education training program that was actually developed here at the Fred Hutch in partnership with Sierra Sisters, a local African-American cancer support group where we were able to train women as peer educators to go back to their home communities and start discussing um, information about endometrial cancer risk and symptoms. Community Empowerment Partners aims to increase knowledge and, knowledge and empowerment about management of abnormal bleeding and symptoms of endometrial cancer among Black women. We trained ECANA ambassadors in 11 states, and we did a formal program evaluation that demonstrated increased endometrial cancer knowledge confidence about discussing the signs and symptoms of endometrial cancer and abnormal bleeding, and also a process evaluation to demonstrate that there was fidelity to the intervention, it was feasible and acceptable. And just to get at the power of using, of working with community members to reach community, I just wanna point out that the participants of these sessions, nearly a quarter had less than high school education, only half had private insurance, and only half, 49 to 52%, had not just ever heard of abnormal uterine bleeding or postmenopausal bleeding, but had ever talked to family members about these symptoms or ever talked to friends about these symptoms. The silencing around the primary symptoms of endometrial cancer is very real. This is why centering the margins or starting with the groups that are most at risk in any given condition with patient engagement is valuable. We've had national programming for endometrial cancer awareness in the black community. We've had several high impact abstracts, presentations and publications, several successful grants, empowerment of our members and many, many, many more opportunities than we can actually handle that we have to turn down. And so I offer to any of the young investigators listening that authentic meaningful engagement leads to the same opportunities and success as what we might call the traditional research path and my opinion, better ideas. And with that, I have to say that I had to challenge myself a year or so, about a year and a half ago, because a race conscious research approach, as I said at the top, is interested in equity by all means. Were we here, or excuse me, so that's what I'm going to talk about now, my future work in the sister study. Because I had to ask myself, are we here to narrow that racial disparity gap or eliminate it? Something I've mentioned a few times that I will call into clarity and um, prominence right now is that not all endometrial cancer is created equal. Over half of black women are diagnosed, have high risk histology types that have higher risk of recurrence and worse outcomes, lower survival. In addition, survival is not just about access to care. We have data from our trials several years back, but we do, where Black women have lower survival on clinical trials with guideline concordant treatment than other women. And specifically in these trials, it's not that Black women responded to chemotherapy less often. It's that they were not able to stay on the trials as long as other women, moving out secondary to toxicity or disease progression. And that's what gets us to this question of the eco-social theory. And these, I would offer problematic silos we have around biological and genetic causes versus social and environmental causes. Because what is true, what we all experience every day walking around is that we are a combination of these things, that our environment very much impacts our biology and our physiology. And epigenetics tells us that our environment also impacts our genetics and the expression thereof. And so thinking about the eco-social theory of disease distribution is what led me to new hypotheses 
and further expansion of my work. Regarding both of these aspects, these ended up both being grant proposals. One, looking at the mechanisms of embodiment of structural racism among women with endometrial cancer, and really getting back to asking the question, how does perinatal early childhood and adult stress relate to epigenetic change in normal and malignant endometrium? Something that we're starting to see in other areas of reproductive health, especially with preterm labor, maternal morbidity and mortality. In addition, regarding survival being more than access to care, we started to get information about social isolation and women not being able to complete treatment, actually being a major modifying influence to whether or not they were able to have um, uh, positive outcomes in terms of lack of recurrence and survival. And so that be begged the question of what the best method was to provide social support in order to decrease social isolation and improve treatment completion. Now, what we know about research is that you have to swing many times and sometimes you'll get it and sometimes you'll miss. So the R01 that was under review um, for the embodiment was not funded yet. I have not given up. However, wonderfully, our PCORI grant was funded. So a little bit more about social isolation and endometrial cancer can be explained looking at this conceptual framework, which is generally around social networks and mechanisms of cancer mortality as a way to improve survival. And what you see here is that social support influences behavior and biology and ultimately treatment completion. And the design of the sister study is to intervene on social support and to measure both the immediate um, effects in terms of social support and the more downstream in terms of treatment completion. Everything highlighted in yellow is what we will be measuring on the sister study. This is a national multi-center randomized control trial. We have 10 centers right now where we'll, we will be enrolling um, black women who have confirmed diagnoses of high-risk endometrial cancer, new or recurrent, and have a treatment recommendation of either chemotherapy, radiation, and actually we have added um, immunotherapy. They'll be enrolled with baseline demographic and clinical data collection, and then randomized to three different evidence-based interventions for social support that have already proven to improve both social isolation and also improve um, adherence to treatment um, and sometimes treatment completion depending on the disease site. This will be a six month um, study for the patients that are enrolled and we'll be collecting survey data as well as treatment data from their medical record in terms of toxicity and ability to complete treatment. Our first aim on this study is to determine whether and to what extent these virtual social support interventions improve recommended treatment completion and we'll be using the measure of relative dose. We'll be comparing social isolation using patient reported outcome measures along with a number of other measures. And then thinking about feasibility, scalability and ultimate incorporation into clinical care, we have an aim to evaluate the acceptability of these interventions, not just among the patients, but among healthcare staff and the peer support providers. So with regard to the black-white mortality gap in endometrial cancer, we have a lot of things going. We continue our early stage of diagnosis work, trying to improve early stage of diagnosis among black women with the um, national provider survey that will lead into the intervention development, as well as the work um, on transvaginal ultrasound guideline revisions, which we just had a grant funded based on the data that I showed you to be able to reassess those guidelines incorporating factors like risk of underlying high-risk histology and fibroids to determine a more risk-based approach for women who might more appropriately need to go straight to biopsy rather than go through ultrasound. With regard to econic advocacy and research, I did not focus on that for this talk, but we have a lot of community gathering and programming, um, ongoing weekly events for women um, newly diagnosed all over the country that, who join us. We do research consultations with groups beyond the University of Washington to help them bring patient engagement into their research on endometrial cancer. And we continue public health awareness with interviews um, with media and campaigns. And then finally, with regard to embodiment and outcomes, um, I continue with the work regarding embodiment as well as the sister study. Ultimately, the goal of all of this is to close, not just narrow, but close the gap. And this is why I wanna take a note to circle back to how we began and some of these unfortunate um, curriculum on racial disparities research that I think can be present in academic medicine, which is that having an 
equity orientation in contrast to the sense that it limits ideas or creativity or scope, having a race conscious approach actually necessitates an abundance of all three. And on the right side, you see all of the different methods that I am either trained in or collaborate with and have engaged with experts in, in order to meet the goal of equity and endometrial cancer. I think it's a wonderful, exhilarating and really interesting way to build a career in academic medicine. In conclusion, contemporary health disparities research should be theoretically based and equity oriented. To pursue a goal of equity, race consciousness and community engagement are required. They're not just bonus. It's really time to move beyond silos of biological versus social causes of excess black mortality and endometrial cancer and I offer everything else to a common goal of equitable diagnosis, treatment and survival. And endometrial cancer is common and this inequity deserves public health awareness and national attention. And I just have a couple more slides because awareness is rising. We see the CDC having taken this up with some, um, with some uh, outreach. Ami Nachu So is one of the few public figures who's a black woman and is public about her endometrial cancer diagnosis. Endometrial cancer also was the cause of death of Gwen Eiffel, for those interested. My own Foundation for Women's Cancer through the SGO has started promoting awareness around symptoms more. And we have had um, features about endometrial cancer in national news outlets, including BET, and I still can't believe it, but in December, I was on Good Morning America discussing endometrial cancer on a national platform. However, we still have work to be done because endometrial cancer is still forgotten, even among those of us that should be most aware. The AACR Cancer Disparities Report in 2020 was a specific commissioned report by Congress to look at cancer health disparities by race and other factors. And endometrial cancer was not highlighted in this report. It wasn't highlighted in the graphics that were you know, created for um, public consumption. And it even wasn't highlighted in data tables where cervix cancer shows up, um, but not endometrial cancer, which is both more common and has a larger racial disparity. So I do think we can and we will do better so that we might all thrive. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge my funding supports um, on the left there, my research team, I do not do this all alone, and the asterisks are the students that I've worked with at the University of Washington, both amazing um, students that have informed this work as well, the Econa team, my mentors and advisors, and the scholarship of the women and the people who've come before me that helped to expand my own framework and allow me to do this work building off their prior work. Thank you. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, thanks, Kimmy. Um, interestingly, I'm worried about Liz Swisher. Uh, Liz has asked a question here uh, that was a question I had. Uh, first, let me just say that she says, wonderful talk, truly amazing, impactful work uh, that will change healthcare and save lives. And I think all of us truly uh, share that. This really was just an astounding talk. Um, she goes on, given the high consequences uh, and, and your circular construct for delays in care, it seems likely that uh, TVUS is not only less sensitive for Black women, but is likely to be uh, a, a direct contributor to delay to treatment. Mm -hmm. So she's just asking, she wants to be clear, do you re recommend that the first stop in, in diagnosis uh, be the biopsy rather than uh, TVUS. Yeah. I was actually wondering, are you at the point where TVUS should just be gotten rid of and kind of everybody goes to a biopsy being kind of low risk? Yeah, so I, this is a really important question. And, you know, it, it is where the scientist in me does take over and the conservative nature of being sure before you change a complete paradigm without knowing the consequences. I think we have to be careful. So I do think I can com I can comfortably say that the current strategy is not ideal, period. Um, rather than adopting a strategy that is race based, which has other issues, saying all black women should get a biopsy, nobody else should or everybody should go to ultrasound. What we really need to do is 
like what we did in the study, identify what are the underlying factors that would make a transvaginal ultrasound screening less accurate. We know one of them is fibroids. We know another one of them is a risk of high-risk histology. There are likely others, and that's part of what we're funded to do now is to look at things like endometriosis, look at things like other reproductive health histories to see how these also might imp impact that strategy. Ultimately, I think it would be nice for us to have a risk-based algorithm where if patients meet a certain number of these factors, it just makes no sense to do an ultrasound and they need to go straight to biopsy. Um, there has been recent work by um, Megan Clark out of the Mayo Clinic where they did a cross-sectional study. It was um, nearly all white women. I think five, there were a total of five black women in the entire population of maybe a thousand. And um, what they demonstrated is that they actually started questioning the use of transvaginal ultrasound for any woman over 60. So again, because when women are, the older and older women are at age 60 and up, that level of high-risk histology or non-endometriate histology goes up. And so the transvaginal ultrasound strategy starts to get less effective. So having said all of that, yes, I think that is where we are going. And my last caveat is that we cannot do these things in the absence of community engagement. And so when we have a population and group like black women that have historically suffered from um, over intervention, from experimentation and from a real, um, a real just painful and sad history, especially with regard to reproductive and gynecologic healthcare, we have to be careful before we try to roll out a strategy that in a lot of people's minds will be more invasive than what we have right now. And so another part of the work that we're doing is working with communities of black women to think about how would you message, how would you explain this so that women feel very empowered to ask for and want a biopsy as opposed to feeling like this is a yet another intervention being placed upon them. So that is my long answer to say, I think we're moving in that direction and I think we should do it with deliberateness. So we're not recreating some of the problems that we see right now when we move too quickly. So, so wonderful. Thanks, Kimmy. Let me go on with this question here. It says, also, I imagine that the data from the Papelli type office biopsy being so sensitive for EMC diagnosis in women uh, with uh, PMB uh, is also not uh, based on black women. Are you confident in the sensitivity of office biopsy in black women? No, <laughs> so I'm not because I'm not confident in the, in the sensitivity of office biopsy for non-endometrioid histology types. And so again, I, this, is why, this is why racial equity research is so powerful, I think, because it's not just about the group in focus, it's about everybody. So once you realize that it doesn't really work for this group, and the reason is because non-endometrioid histology, it's not sensitive enough. One, sure, we probably are gonna to move to not doing this anymore among black women because they're gonna meet risk factors. But then when we zoom out, John, endometrial cancer incidence is rising and it's mostly rising because of the non-endometrioid types. So this is also in line with work that's gonna probably show that overall, this is going to be a less and less effective strategy. Where we go from there, I think we really have to think about because our only other option right now is a dilation and curatage, which happens in an operating room usually. So do we want to start a paradigm of moving from an ultrasound to an operating room procedure yeah. for every woman with bleeding? No. But do we want to start reinvesting in ways to detect endometrial cancer, for example, through tampons, through some of the screen, the pap smear, some of the screening things that are trying to be tried? Yes, and it's even more important now that we're seeing that this is a cause of inequity. Yeah, so moving to a genetic diagnosis based on a tampon or something, is, is that kind of what you see? Yeah, like a less invasive test that might be more, exactly what Liz wrote, that might be more yeah. sensitive for high-risk types. So I'm really excited about that research. <laughs> and um, we, this is a larger question, but as a field, we also need to ensure that Black women are included in those studies so that somebody else in 10 years doesn't give the same talk that I'm giving about how we again missed the boat and created an algorithm that doesn't work well for the group most at risk. Yeah, outstanding. Unfortunately, we're at time. Um, I think you're just gonna have to come back annually. So. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck? Um, you'll be getting a certificate that will note, I, I tell people this, it's one thing to be invited to talk someplace else, uh, but when your peers you know, invite you to come and wanna listen to you, you've hit a high mark. Uh, so we'll get a little certificate of recognition out to you. Thank you, thank, John. I yeah, thank it. you very much. Really, really astounding. Yes, thank you. And thank you yep. for everybody who showed up. Thank you. Bye-bye.